Topics based around Torque Ripple and, and Torque related um, matters. So I think uh, this is really kind of the nuts and bolts of why can we measure Torque Ripple so much better? And it's really kind of the functional, how do we measure the frequency output of a torque sensor? So, um, as we've all probably heard, heard a million times, um, things to consider with a torque sensor are your accuracy, and especially when you're looking at quantities like torque ripple or small disturbances, you want to look at that feather on the elephant's back. You want to look at that very small value of torque on top of a large nominal. Bandwidth, how much frequency content do you want to understand? Um, and, and, you know, how much can I trust? So, you know, with, with something like our T12, you got 0.02% accuracy, six kilohertz of bandwidth. Uh, then the other considerations, which are, are always the nice, fun, physical ones, are what rotational speed am I going to be at? Um, with a lot of electric motors, we're going to, to really high speeds, and you need to have a sensor that's not going to throw itself apart, um, or, or it's going to retain its torsional stiffness and give you a good accuracy, even at high speeds. How is it mounted? What's the signal type? And, and I think signal type is kind of the, the big dog for today. Um, so let's, let's get after it. So kind of stepping into a, a overly simplified uh, explanation of our torque sensor, and I'm, I'm sure there's some people at HBM who won't be pleased at me for simplifying to this extent, but on the left-hand side here, uh, we use a telemetry-based torque sensor. So we have this, this stator that is completely decoupled from the rotor. So there's actually an air gap between the two. It's usually, a, I think it's a one to two millimeter air gap. So they're completely se separate. The stator is inductively powering the rotor and all the magic happens on the rotor. So if we zoom in on the rotor, and, and this is my, my cross section uh, where we have like this H shape. And so you have your mounting bolts here, you'd mount the sensor here. And in this little H area, we have strain gauges. So this is an extremely well characterized piece of metal um, where we have a number of strain gauges. I, I think it's somewhere in the, the realm of 12 to 16, depending on the sensor. Um, they're very special st strain gauge. So we can see they've got this chevron shape um, that's actually for measuring torque. HBM makes all our strain gauges ourselves, so, so we know this world extremely well. Now, anybody who spent any time around strain gauges know that it's not just the gauge that matters. It's not just the material it's on, but it's also the amplification, the excitation, and the compensation. So we have a little circuit board indicated by this green here where we are providing power to the gauges. We're compensating for things like rotational speed, temperature, um, linearity, and hysteresis effects of the metal. Um, and, and we're compensating that out making sure we have exactly five volts of that gauge. We're taking that millivolt per volt signal, amplifying it, and then digitizing it all on the rotor. It's pretty cool stuff. Um, so if we follow the signal path, and, and I, I made this slide for a customer a couple months ago, and uh, I, I kind of liked it. Um, so I, I'll share it with you guys today. So on the rotor, so we have kind of this void between rotor and stator. We have Screen, strain gauge um, output signal, so the millivolt per volt signal. We have some analog filtering, analog digital conversion. And then we pass that through an air gap. So digital communication, it's actually um, at a high frequency communication to the stator. So the stator receives that signal across that air gap. And then once we're in the sta stator, um, there's some further signal compensation and linearization some digital filtering, and then the digital signal is converted to a frequency output. This is where we kind of get into the acquisition, acquisition stage of things. So as many of you might know, our, our torque sensors output uh, a frequency signal or something like 60 kilohertz square wave equals zero Newton meters. 90 kilohertz would be full scale, 30 kilohertz would be negative full scale. So we use this frequency as a, as a really noise immune medium of communication. So we output that frequency signal, which has the full bandwidth, the full accuracy, and that digital signal that's converted to that frequency is then brought into our HBME drive system. And that's what I'm gonna show examples from today. 
So we're physically recording that frequency signal, we're interpreting it, and then we're averaging it on different time periods to display what you want. And that's what we're gonna to touch on next. So that physical frequency signal is measured into the E drive, and then we go from there. So, so let's look at that frequency signal. So in order to measure the frequency signal, we need to understand the frequency signal a little bit. So in this graph on the bottom here, and I kind of regret this, I wish you to put it on top. Um, we have this pulse train. And this is just a digital rep representation of that square wave coming out of the torque sensor. And we can see that we have a pulse train. And obviously this pulse train has a frequency. And, and this is that frequency we're measuring. So this is actually a recording of the frequency output of the torque sensor. So we're actually recording each one of those pulses. We record this signal with a high accuracy timer counter channel. That timer counter can measure up to five megahertz. So the 60 kilohertz isn't even scraping the surface of what this guy can measure. Um, I think it's actually like a hundred hertz, hundred megahertz clock. It's looking for rising edges. We're not looking at signal. We're looking at rising edges because it's digital. And again, we're looking for that level crossing, not, not the physical signal. And by recording this, measurement period, this allows us to choose our measurement time. And, and this here is just kind of a snippet from our, our data sheet. You might, you might see similar things in other data sheets about that timer counter channel, what it can be used for, and, and some of the details. Um, and it's really just saying, hey, we're very accurately looking at rise times, we're recording when these rise times happen, and we're interpreting things like frequency from them, these digital events. So let's take a real signal because real signals are fun, and, and, and I think we've been through enough of these that we know I always come back to real signals. Here is my pulse train for what looks to be something like two seconds. This is that signal I just showed, that little pink square wave, but it's on such a short time frame that it all looks like one continuous line. We then average this signal over a couple different periods. For example, this first one here, I do a 10 cycle average. So it's 10 electrical cycles. So there's 10 sine waves in each of these segments. This is something we would use for an efficiency test. We want our torque and speed to be perfectly aligned with our electrical signals, say from a, a engine or, or even more specifically what I care about, motors and inverters. Um, these 10 electrical cycles will give us a very, very precise average on our torque measurement. We remember back to a couple of my uh, torque segments from earlier. Um, we talk about how important having that time alignment is for accuracy. But we get this basically steady state value. You know, torque's not changing a whole lot here. This talk about torque ripple, there's none. This is a very dynamic or a very steady state measurement that we'd use for efficiency. If we look at just one cycle, so one sine wave, we're gonna see that okay, this torque does bounce around a little bit. We get a little bit of movement, and, and we expect that. But it's still pretty steady state. We might not use this for efficiency, but we might use it for something like dynamic efficiency in a, in a drive cycle test. All right, let's get to the interesting stuff. So now instead of using a cycle average, I start using a, a arbitrary time period. In this instance, a one millisecond average. So for one millisecond, I average all the pulses in one millisecond. We can see I get these little discrete chunks here. And this kind of looks like our, our more like traditional 8-bit signals that, that we might we might see. And we can see we, we, we now have some dynamics, but not much. Th this is enough to really start getting there. This tells us the basics. This kind of tells us if there's some drastic swings going on. Um, but if we really want to start looking at torque ripple, we have to start looking at a, sl a, a smaller time basis. So instead of one millisecond, we go five times less, and we look at 200 microseconds. And here we can still see a little digitization, but we're starting to get a lot more dynamic. We get things like, you know, slotting effects or things like, you know, control resonance maybe. We can, we can really start to see some details. And then I go down to 66.6 .6 microseconds, and we really get a whole lot of detail on the frequency content. Now, like anything in life, there's engineering trade-offs. We'll touch on those in a moment. Um, and another thing, and I had to throw this example in here, if you just say, I'm just gonna take every frequency pulse and give an output, you end up getting a little bit of nonsense in these drops. 
um, you do need at least a couple of those frequency outputs to really get a rational signal. So keep that in mind um, when, when you're going through and doing these types of tests. But I, I, I think this is pretty interesting. With that same recorded signal, your interpretation of it can be extremely different. You can do efficiency with that same signal. You can do torque ripple with that same signal. That, that's kind of the power of recording that actual pulse train like we do in the, the HBME drive system. Now, you might say, well, like anything, the longer I average, the higher resolution I'm going to get, and, and does short averaging periods affect my accuracy? And the answer is yes, although probably not how you would think. The torque sensor accuracy is, is going to be what it is. What we have to start looking at is the amplifier accuracy, and I think this very often gets neglected because you might say, why would I use that, you know, 10 cycle averaging period when I could get all that dynamic. Hear me out here. So this is actually directly from our data sheet. And this is the delta time error of, of the gate. And that means absolutely nothing to anybody because it took me a long time to figure out what it actually meant. But what this is saying is that we're looking at a pulse train and we're averaging over one microsecond we're going to have a 5% error from the amplifier. Now, fortunately for us, we're not measuring at one microsecond. Um, but we get this equation for the accuracy of the amplifier, and it says 50 na nanoseconds over the gate time. So 50 nanoseconds over the averaging period of that frequency. Let's linearize that and look at it. So my graph down here basically says from one microsecond to 10 seconds, the error percent of my amplifier is here. Now, with this torque sensor, there's no rational way you'd ever measure here. You don't even really have a purpose to measure here. You could, but you'd get garbage. Um, you'd get an uninterpretable signal like that one we looked at, that, that 50 millisecond average period, or microsecond, excuse me. 100 microseconds, this starts to get reasonable. You know, 10 kilohertz, 10 kilosamples per second, that's more than the bandwidth of the sensor, but Maybe somebody's got a better sensor than us. Um, I doubt it, but could be. And who knows what the future brings? But even that, that's 0 0.05. That's starting to get acceptable. So let's look at the actual reasonable range of the gate time, so the averaging period of the torque sensor. And what we see is we get something, this area of interest here, where we're really looking you know, at 0 0.001%, 0 0.005%. at the absolute most blaring bandwidth. So that's kind of the full bandwidth of the sensor. And when we start even getting to the one second averaging period, that's a lot of zeros. You're effectively taking the amplifier out of the um, uncertainty equation, which is cool. We're all right with that. Um, so that's pretty neat. I, I, I think that's really cool. So the longer you average the signal for, the lower the measurement uncertainty of your amplifier. So when you're doing things like efficiency equations, and you're taking, you know, a half second or one second of data, you can go to yourself and say, all right, I'm good. I don't really have to worry about that measurement error. Um, and this isn't true for all, all people who measure frequency signals. So please look at, at what the measurement error on a frequency signal is. It is relevant. Um, we, we do a particularly good job at it um, when you take the actual area of interest into account. Um, so we're really good at this. There's a lot of words to say we're really good at this. We measure we measure the torque signal more accurately than anybody else. Now, to kind of put that in perspective and, and just get another look at measuring that torque signal, I've zoomed in on that signal I showed previously. So here's our pulse train. And I couldn't even get the 10 cycles all in one area. But, but with that 10 cycles, we're effectively measuring 2,300 pulses. That's a really wide gate time. This is the most accurate from the amplifier standpoint and has the lowest bandwidth. I, I think that becomes very clear with this extremely static value. We look at a single cycle average. We got about 230 pulses averaged. And we can see that we still have a pretty steady state value. One millisecond averaging, we have about 59 pulses. So we still actually probably have like a 0.005% accuracy. Um, so still an extremely accurate measurement from the amplifier standpoint 
and we start to get some dynamic. Then we start moving down and, and we get, you know, 11 pulses averaged and we can see that, uh, let me make a better drawing. We see that here, that 11 pulses, lower bandwidth, or excuse me, higher bandwidth, less accuracy from the amplifier standpoint. And then we have kind of our highest bandwidth is this 3.9 pulses. And we can see with 2.5 pulses averaged, looking up here, looking down here. Yeah, we're getting drops. We, we don't have enough signal. Um, so I, I think this is all pretty interesting. And, and I could go down the rabbit hole with anybody who's, who's really interested in learning more. Um, but kind of the answer to why we want this bandwidth, why we want to measure torque ripple, is we can start looking at the frequency content of our torque and we can start saying, all right, I have a major resonance here and I've got a minor resonance here and I've got some frequency activity out here. So what these really short averaging periods allow us to do is start looking at the frequency domain of our signal. And that, that to me is pretty cool. And that opens a whole lot of opportunities for um, understanding vehicle experience, understanding efficiency and, and doing things like NVH analysis. So with that, I, I went two minutes over, uh, so I apologize, but I'd like to thank you all for, for joining us. Um, if you're interested in learning more, please reach out to me directly. I, I think Vitor's put uh, contact information in the chat. You can learn more about our electric power testing products here. Um, and as always, uh, feel free to reach out and please join our, um, our future sessions and, and our digital conference coming up in a, in a month. Okay, Mitch, thank you so much for your presentation. Uh, now let's give some time to our attendees to send their questions to us. Um, a quick reminder that, uh, yeah, we have the electric, electric power testing page here, the link, so you can click there on, on and follow or just use the QR code that Mitch um, has on, on his PowerPoint. Um, Okay, so just a quick reminder: we will have we will have on HBK side um, on October the virtual conference. Um, I will add this link to you all in a few seconds. You can just go there, subscribe. It's free. You can you can register and you receive all the information on your email. Uh, so you're more than invited to uh, be with us there. It's the first. Uh, first conference that we were going to host digitally, so we are really excited about it. Uh, and of course, we are looking forward to see you there. Um, so much seems so far we don't have any questions, but um, if we don't send your question today, don't worry, you can send it later. Mitch has its own contact form on our website. You can contact Mitch using um, your um, your laptop and of course our our web page. So just make sure you go there and create your questions to Mitch there, or if you just want to um, find more information regarding the electrical power measurement, you can do that too. So Mitch, I think it's all for today. Um, all right. Thank you so much once again, and thanks to all the attendees. Cheers. Okay, thank you, thank you Mitch. See you next time. Goodbye.